Hey, I'm S.A. Collins here by my lonesome today because poor Vance is literally chest deep in snow and he's trying to dig his way back to the house. So it's just me for this week. Uh, we are doing uh, Written on the Edge, Season 9, Episode 3. We're here with our guest, John Musgrove, who's here to talk about his latest release. <music> our guest. John Musgrove grew up in Virginia and had a stint in the U.S. Navy starting his IT career. He married the love of his life in 1986, and they've been, they haven't been apart since their first date. I know the feeling. <laughs> he waited until middle age to begin writing seriously, but now he's all in. He prefers to the write the historical fiction that illuminates otherwise forgotten LGBTQ figures that made history for other reasons. Louis Ginter, Grace Arendt, James Buchanan, and Baron von Steuben, to name a few. He's known throughout Richmond as Cookie John for his baking prowess and as an IT geek, nerdy, introverted, fascinated by technology and easily distracted by the next shiny thing that catches his eye. I think I accused him of being part crow in our last interview. So <laughs> welcome, John. Welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> Excellent. So for those who did, weren't privileged enough to have watched the first episode with you, why don't you explain really quick how you get into writing and then we'll move on to all the goodies. Well, sure. Uh, we've always been big travelers and I actually had a friend who is blind, who was a transcriptionist and she asked what time, what do you do on your travels? So I sat down and wrote it and I, you know, typed it out. It was long winded. It was terrible. And then I never stopped. So we've been to 52 countries, uh, 40 states. Every time we go somewhere, I type it all out. I share it. So I've really cut my chops doing nonfiction. But then I got into, you know, fiction. I wanted to tell stories about people that, you know, we know, but we don't know the full history of. Right. All right. Well, what it, we're here to talk about your next book in the Reticent Richmond series, Mary's Grace, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so what's the elevator pitch? If I were to walk up and see this book, what would you tell me about it? Grace Arendt was the well-known woman who inherited all the money from her tobacco uncle, Louis Ginter. She went into education instead of putting her feet up like a wealthy woman might do. She built baths. She did more for the community than they can print in a full edition of the newspaper when she died. She Excellent. also happened to be a lesbian and she lived, you know, 20 years with the, her partner. Uh, just, you know, as some people do, you know. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you've explained a little bit about Grace and Mary and how they connect to Lewis Ginter. So what is Mary's Grace about in a nutshell? By 1900, uh, Grace Arendt really is alone in the world. Her mm -hmm. uncle, her whole family has died or moved to New York. She is alone in Richmond. She has enormous amounts of wealth. We're talking Astor's Vanderbilt kind of money. Mm. Uh, she's still, you know, part of the uh, tobacco trade because she's in receiving, you know, uh, dividends from that. But she decides she wants to be in education. So she builds a library. She builds schools. And of course, she has to hire people to do that. And she only hires women over and over and over because uh, nobody else will hire women. One of the women that she hires, she falls for very quickly <laughs> and they become very close friends. They move in together and then they spend 20 years reshaping the educational landscape of Richmond. Excellent. God, that sounds like a really fascinating book. So how did they change the landscape? I mean, can you give us a little more about that without oh, being too spoilery? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Grace was originally a nurse. So she did the Visiting Nurses Association, and she realized that most of her work was going to be teaching people more about hygiene, uh, doing things for people at a, at a basic level. There's no indoor plumbing in 1900 in Richmond. Uh, hopefully we have it all now, but uh, <laughs> So she builds baths. Some parts of know. West Virginia, who knows? <laughs> I know, I know. But she, she built a bathhouse where it was free to go and take a bath. And to them, it was swimming. But it was once a week they were getting good hygiene. 
Um, she built schools and when no one showed up, she did some analysis and figured out that all the kids were working because the parents were so poor. So she changed the classes from daytime to nighttime. Mm. And the parents were standing outside the, the door listening in. She realized a lot of the parents were illiterate also. She made special classes for them basic stuff so they could read and write and do their you know banking and all the other stuff they would need to be just to be an adult in society wow so she transformed generations of people from illiterate you know non-educated people to at least you know getting to a a level where they could function in society you know it's it's really amazing to me i mean i I'm doing a whole series of these reaction to videos and stuff, and I'm educating Albert on some of queer history through cinema. And it amazes me how much the youth, because Albert's a younger generation than either of us. Um, and uh, I know you're only 24. I'm sorry. I, I, but, you know, you get, you know, I'm fine with that. Um, but, uh, and one of the things that he's always commented on is how much, or how little he knows of queer history and how shocked he is about the resiliency of our community at times when we were probably the most oppressed. Um, do you find that on the road when, or whenever you meet people who are, are interested in that kind of queer historical writing, um, do you find that is prevalent or do you find people that follow, find your books are generally people who are historically knowledgeable? Oh, just the opposite. Um, I, I do a lot of history lectures, uh, the local universities, the retirement homes, and we get these people that are probably uh, as old as my parents, maybe almost mm -hmm. my age. They mm -hmm. have no idea that we struggled so much through the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, they may have seen a uh, one-off movie or something, but they thought if people just worked and did their jobs and keep their head down, they had no problems. And are they, are they generally shocked by what you reveal? Absolutely. So they really didn't understand that there was a gay subculture, even in Richmond, mm. or that people struggled or that, you know, having money and put somebody, you know, in a different stratosphere where they just couldn't be touched. They can't be fired. They can't be intimidated. You know, people want their money for projects, so they're going to be nice to them, yeah. even to their face, if they're not, you know, nice all the time. Is there anything I fail to ask regarding this book particular before we talk about your next, your fall release? The, the one that really hit me so hard when I was doing the research was this African-American woman who was born of freed slaves. So her parents were slaves. They, they are freed. They get married. They have children. And they insist that their children all get the best education they can. And of course, that's piecemeal at the time. There are no public schools. African American kids are still relegated to, you know, these terrible schoolhouses. She becomes a teacher. Her name is Virginia Estelle Randolph. She was born and raised right here in my county. And she did everything that Grace and Mary did, but she did it with all the obstacles of being a poor black woman in mm -hmm. a society where people didn't want her to succeed. Um, before she died, she had a school named after her. She had programs designed after her curricula. She was amazing. You know, I, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you watch it or, you know, as a historic, history buff, you probably do. But the Gilded Age, I, one of the things I love about it is that they're talking about these very yes. things that are very yeah. American. And, you know, you have these pseudo historical figures that are patterned after people that really did exist and do some of these things you know i'm thinking peggy scott's character working in the black community actually you know delving into um you know trying to bring up the the black community into developing schools and such which is literally right down the line of what you're saying here um and i just find it interesting that even in a show like that, they do thread the queer factor through it in that how queer people had to make their way through it. Are you encouraged by how some of this history, I'm mean, thinking also fellow travelers, which just recently aired that dealt with the McCarthy era and stuff. Are, are you feeling encouraged that our queer history is now starting to be reflected? Absolutely. Uh, fellow travelers has been one of those talking points for me because my husband and I were in it. 
Yeah, my we husband was too. In the yeah. filming. Yeah. We were literally oh, in wow. the filming. Oh, wow. Excellent. Yeah, he's got antique cars, so we got to be extras. We're all dressed up. You know, we, we can spot ourselves in episodes. We know where the filming was. Oh, wow. You know, so, you know, all of our car friends that were there were telling them these stories. You know, the same thing with Grace and all these other things where we had it so hard, but we still made it through. Some mm -hmm. people did, sadly, you know, but, you know, we, we, we persevered and we made it through. And now we have these heartbreaking stories. Uh, that are important. And, that are that are extremely important for people to see what happened so we don't go back to that right and i think you know you know the, there's that old line you know those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it or something of that that nature but i think the children don't as billy porter likes to call them uh i think the children just really they 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 don't know of this stuff but when they find out about it they're incredibly fascinated by it which is encouraging. It's wonderful. I mean, even, you know, we, it's really sad when you look at a show like Pose and the kids all think it's ancient history. You're going, child, <laughs> <laughs> come here so I can smack you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get out of my chair, but I'm too old. Um, but, you know, I, I just, I find that historical works are kind of have, I'm starting to see a resurgence. And I don't know if it's driven by people doing video essays on YouTube or what it's being done by, but the kids I'm finding are fascinated by it. And I'm starting to see a peaked interest in media in general that a lot of the youth are very becoming very aware of how precarious all the things they've taken for granted up to this point mm -hmm. are. And it's history showing them. And I, I think that is a really beautiful thing um, so with that in mind, uh, unless you have something else to contribute about uh, Mary's Grace, what what, what uh, would we want to talk about with the book's fall release, book three in the series, Garland's Legacy? Um, do you want to uh, comment on that? Sure. Um, Mary Garland Smith was, you know, head over heels in love with Grace. She loses her in 1926. And everyone thinks this woman who's 62 is going to die. And you know that'll be the end of the thing. She lived another 40 years. She was just shy of 101 when she wow. died in 1968. So she, you know, eventually, you know, she pulls out of her grief and she becomes a patron of the arts, but she also becomes a protector. We had very famous people rolling through Richmond. The one that comes to mind is Walter Chrysler of the Chrysler family. He came to Richmond, he got to a, drunk at a party and tried to kiss the police officers that were arresting him for disorderly conduct. There were no female police officers at the time. So Garland and her friends bailed him out of jail and got him back to Norfolk where he was in the Navy so he could get on a ship and get out of there. And they did that repeatedly for all these people who got in trouble. You know, they just stepped in where they thought, you know, they could do better than the people were doing for themselves at the time. Mm. It's been fascinating to research. I, I just love the stories. That sounds really, really cool. Um, hopefully you can come back and we can have a deeper dive discussion once the book's released and talk about that. I'd love that. Yes. Excellent. Um, okay. Well, is there anything else you wanted to bring up while we have you before we get to this year's rapid fire questions? I think we're good. Okay, excellent. Well, moving on to that, we have decided to dive deeper this year. So in that vein, what's your favorite writing or snack or drink? Coffee. Absolutely. Coffee, <laughs> coffee, coffee. The bean, the bean, the bean, the bean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what books did you grow up reading? Uh, I went back and did some research and I did a lot of historical fiction. So I loved um, Gary Jennings and his Aztec and Marco Polo and all those things. But I was also a fan from 1970s uh, on of Stephen King. You know, he tells a good story. I don't always like the gore now, but I, de I do want to- Or the queer representation. <laughs> well, you know, he's actually gotten better about that. With yes, his he has. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. You know, I was, I, I'm still a fan because I, I pick up a 600 page book and I sigh. And then I'm finished in two days because I couldn't put it down. Right, right, right. That's always a good that. thing. All right. So uh, who has been the biggest supporter of your writing? Oh, my husband. Yeah. Absolutely. He is the very first to read when I say I'm finished. He's the first editor. 
he is also my publicist, so he is actively beating the bushes and trying to get me appearances. Well, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> I pay him well. He gets my whole paycheck. Well, so. see, there you go. There you go. All right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? I am an old guy, so I'm a morning person. I am up every day at four o'clock. Jesus, girl. That's Seven amazing. days a week. That's about if we the go time to Europe, I'm going to bed. <laughs> If we go to Europe within two days, I'm back on my schedule, wide awake, ready to run. Wow. Okay. Don't know what it is. Much props to you. Yeah, I'm more of a night owl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what's your favorite hobby outside of writing? Photography is my passion. You know, capturing that perfect image is just the height of self fulfillment for me. Is it uh, standard photography? I mean, because there's all kinds of. of genres and subgenres and photography some people do just do black and white some people do macro you know so is there any particular kind that you do i like landscapes i like cityscapes you know i want to capture that image that says that's that's london that's paris that's cairo okay you know, people all nod and say yeah that's the one okay all right well uh has writing and publishing a book changed the way you see yourself Oh, absolutely. I realize now that I'm the beneficiary of so much that's come before me, but we also have so far to go. Mm -hmm. Education and, and building empathy amongst our, you know, our fellow citizens. We right. just don't seem to get it some days. Right. <laughs> and I think the other part of it is also that, you know, uh, people have imposter syndrome even before they start. They think, oh, no one will want to hear my story. But they would be surprised how many people would probably be very interested in, in other queer people's stories and writings. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So excellent. All right. Well, if you were to write a spinoff about a side character in one of your novels, which one would you pick? I would think John Frederick Allen. He was the partner for Lewis Ginter. Mm. And we find out in the first book that they were actually lovers for a while because the Pickings are pretty slim in 1860s <laughs> Richmond. Yeah, it wasn't like there was a gay rag you could go to. No, <laughs> you know, there's no, no real competition. But I think he lived a, a very interesting life. And of course, he died and then went into obscurity because he had no family. Right, right. All right. Well, have you ever traveled as research for your book? This is a silly question. We already know the answer. <laughs> well, I've not done it for research, but I'm planning to do it this year. I'm doing a book on John Maynard Keynes. Ah, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go to Cambridge and look at his actual personal papers and do some. Oh, oh, now yeah. that's juicy. That's really juicy. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He was amazing. He, he kept spreadsheets when he was in college. Wow. Of everything he did with everybody he did it with. Oh, my goodness. And they yeah. were all male. And oh. he gave them grades. Oh, 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 sauce for the gander. OK, all right. There we go. All right. Yeah. Well, how do you celebrate when you finish a book? I dance around the room. I don't need oh. music. It's just that push away from the keyboard. Well, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> then maybe you go have a good dinner, you know. Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, you made it through this year's list. Bravo. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we know a bit about what you're doing. Um, do you want to give people uh, an idea of where they can follow you to find out what you're up to next? Sure. I, I am on Instagram every day. I actually posted pictures of myself in costume for the fellow traveler shoot. Ooh. You know, so all the cars are out there. Uh, it's got my little card that says I was on it. Um, I, I, I don't do much on Facebook anymore, but Instagram, it just gives me that visual, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And I'm always on LinkedIn, you know, because I'm a professional and I have to connect. Right. And I think it's interesting that, you know, you most people of our generations, uh, you know, kind of are moving away from Facebook. I'm noticing that. And they're kind of just, they like the more yeah. even keel and less, there's no doom scrolling. So, you know, you get just really nice, pretty pictures and little incidental stories about them and such. Um, and I find that a lot of people are kind of wanting, I think we're, we're over toxicity because I noticed that, you know, with threads and blue sky and some of these other that are cropping up to try and take the place of Twitter. I think people are just tired they don't they don't want that kind of negativity anymore you know i don't yeah i want i want cats i want memes yeah exactly exactly <laughs> girl ain't got time for all that shit you know <laughs> over there you know i got the i got news if i need to see that stuff yeah really <laughs>
I can right. bring myself down. <laughs> right, right. So are you doing any uh, public appearances or any kind of uh, lectures that you want to tell people about? So we are working with Lewis Gintra Botanical Gardens, the, the garden name for the first book, uh, on his 200th birthday celebration for April 24th. You know, so it's going to be, you know, probably a week long event, a lot of appearances, a lot of lectures. Uh, we don't actually act, have actual dates or appearance times, but we will get it out there on social media. Oh, lovely. That sounds really cool. Um, if I start walking now from San Diego. Yeah, I could be there by April. <laughs> <laughs> they do have planes. Oh, right? OK, OK, OK. Must what are these planes you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to John for coming back and being our returning champion. Uh, we have written in the edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. If you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media, please like and subscribe so that you can get alerts for new episodes. The show was produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listening stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.podcast.com. Dot com. I don't know why I said dot com. <laughs> Woo! That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> Tune in next week for your queer media fix. Oh, what's that? Closing time. The bums rush and melody, dear.